Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> so today I, 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 I'll be giving the talk. Uh, I hope it's going to work out fine. Of, of course, there are technical issues. I, I hopefully that also work out in terms of actually giving the, the talk. And, and second, uh, I mean, this is also a tech, more technical talk than the earlier talks. <clears throat> so I, I apologize in advance. So I heard this will be I, perhaps um, sort of too unusual and too sophisticated in the sense that you've not been exposed to it before. Or if you had been exposed to it before, it will seem too obvious and too superficial and inexact. So, I, I, so I'm trying to sort of to give you a flavor of, of quantum mechanics. I mean, what actually we do when we do calculations and the behavior and how we describe nature. Uh, but of course, I cannot go into too much detail for obvious reasons. And I, I hope I'm not going to do it too quickly in the sense that things are not uh, becoming ill-defined. The talks that will follow me, so next week we'll not have a talk, and the talks that will, will follow thereafter will be more in the spirit of what we had earlier. So more general, I'm talking about um, a, 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 Jenny. Mechanics. I hope you will like it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I, I hope I, I see what, I see a comment here, but yeah, I hope you'll like it. Uh, uh, but but of course, if, if anything is unclear, please do ask me. And if not, of course, you can always ask at the end. So let me mute everybody just so, so it will not be. Differences. And you can, of course, unmute yourself if you have a question. That's really, uh, and let me try to share the screen. Um, let me share the screen. And let me. Just a second. Sorry about this. And, and let me. Okay, so I hope you can see the screen. And. and um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> so as, as the title suggests, this will be about the mathematics that we use to describe quantum mechanics. And then let me, I'm just gonna try to walk you through some of the essential ideas behind that. So I, I'll talk about, so these are sort of the three broad headlines that I want to really outline and, and emphasize. If I try to do even, even one of those, I'll be quite, quite happy with myself. So first I want to describe how we really capture reality in quantum mechanics in, in a sense of not real, you know, other senses I can describe to you later on, but how we actually do calculations. And we do it by describing nature in terms of geometry. So, in ter so we basically describe the state of a system as a so-called vector in some space, which is called Hilbert space. So this is, like what we have in two-dimensional space, and we have three-dimensional space, and so on. This is a generalization to an arbitrary number of dimensions. And with it, we can describe the system as some particular vector that points in some way, I'll make it hopefully clear later on. And we can describe how measurements act and all the paradoxes or seeming paradoxes of quantum mechanics, and importantly, the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. And then we will turn to talk about a realization of that, but perhaps the easiest one conceptually and also historically, how, where it actually all came from, which is that of light and polarizations. So that will allow us to describe measurements in quantum mechanics by looking at polarizers, like you have polarizers in your, some of your sunglasses and so on. And lastly, if I have time, which I probably won't, I'll describe to you something which is called Bell's inequality which was actually at the time was revolutionary and you really ruled out theories involving hidden variables, at least simple theories of hidden variables or more sophisticated ones, which are sort of non-local and so on. But the simple ones are been ruled out. And this is a very simple idea, but it's actually very, very profound. And to this day, people are trying to understand it and generalize it. Okay, so let's start. So, as I mentioned in, in words earlier, so the way we describe nature is in terms of vectors in so-called Hilbert space. So, so you can think about describing, let's say, a particle in some particular location. Class, in a usual way, you'd say, I have a particle. The particle has this mass. 
its location, is it you know, this height and this way and so on. So I just specify where it is and I might give it some velocities and so on. So I can, <clears throat> in quantum mechanics, we specify it in a particular way and we do it by working different so-called bases. And I'll describe to you what these are, but importantly, you can describe completely the state of a system, any system, including the universe, quote unquote, in terms of a collection of numbers. And that collection of numbers will have components along with different axes, like X axis, Y axis, Z axis, that you're accustomed to. And these just correspond to descriptions that you have of, of our state of, of, of nature. Okay, so basically we describe nature in terms of collections of numbers and these numbers define their direction in space. And it has, of course, overall some length and some angles and so on. And we will always work in quantum mechanics. We always work with lengths that are the states themselves correspond to these collections of numbers, these vectors, but always have unit length. And that has to do with probability, with the probability of being, of realizing any possible state that you can envision has to sum to a value of one. So if you make all possible measurements, you have to find something. So that so-called demonstration of probabilities, the probabilities of being anywhere and so on in space or and so on is always sums to a value of one relates to our description of nature in terms of this vector in terms of the ge geometry, but all these vectors, all these arrows will always have a length of one. Okay, so important is just to just repeat myself, we describe nature in terms of geometry, there's one object, this object is an arrow, a generalized arrow, and that arrow always has a length of one. That's it, that's all quantum mechanics really is. But then we ask, how does nature evolve? So then we rotate this, it cannot become longer, because it always has length one. So what we do is we rotate this vector and as the system evolves in time, all that happens is it just keeps rotating in one way or another and so on. And that's it. So here's of course, in, I guess of course, a cartoon and so on. The cartoon is maybe conceptually not the best one, but just to illustrate the notions of distance and, and angles and so on. So Hilbert space is as I said, there's just a fancy, I mean, it's a very profound mathematical idea advanced by David Hilbert, but as much as we're concerned, it's just a simple generalization of what we think about in the plane or in three-dimensional geometry. We just think about lengths, we can describe lengths, we can describe distances between points, and there's a notion of angle. Okay, so of course on the globe, you have to be careful, of course, it's, a sphere, it's really a sphere, so we have, of course, it's not really what you would like to think about as, as, as in this cartoon, that, I mean, this picture that I have here. But that, nonetheless, I want to make it clear that there's a this notion of distance and of angle of direction, and that's it. That's all that we use. And we're going to use that now, not to describe simple geometry that you had, in whatever you, you have had geometry last and use it last, but we're going to use it to describe the complete state of a physical system. <clears throat> we're going to encode it in the geometry. Okay, and all the paradox and all that is associated to that geometry. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I, I hope you can sort of see this clearly. So the system is described by an arrow. The arrow has length one. And it, so basically, if you think about all possible orientations you could have this arrow, it will basically describe something on the, on the sphere. So you have a sphere in this, Hilbert space, we'll describe it more clearly later on. And any point in that sphere describes a, phys a physical system. And all we do is we just evolve the system from one location to another location to another location. So basically we have these states, these blue arrows, as it were, blue and green, etc. arrows. And we perform rotations, these generalized rotations, these red arrows, we take it from initial state, to never state and then to never state and so on. And that's how a system evolves in time. Okay, that's all quantum mechanics really is. And also classical mechanics can be envisioned as, as a particular limit of that, you know, but I don't want to comment on that too much because it just may be confusing. And, and importantly, as I mentioned, the fact that we always have a same length is because the probability 
of anything happening, the sum of all, of all possible outcomes is always equal to one. That means that this length of this arrow always has a total length equal to one. That's where it, for us it relates to. There are other relations of, as to do, you know, that we want to normalize things in math and so on, but I'm not, I don't want to get into that. Okay, so this is how we write in the equations. And don't, if equations scare you, for some of you, this is too obvious. For others of you, this might be sort of, um, uh, okay, maybe I, I should not do that because you're, you're seeing my screen. For some of you, this might be uh, too confusing. Let me actually close this thing here. Um, just a second, because I cannot see what I'm actually showing. Uh, just a second. Anyway, it's fine. I, I, I think I, I, I sort of can guess what, I, what you're, you're saying. Uh, so uh, if, if, something is, if you're not seeing something clearly, please let me know, of course. Unmute yourself and let me know. So basically, we describe the state of the system, this vector, by this psi. So this is just a way of describing the state. You see this Greek letter psi, and that's a vector. That's the state of the system. That's historically how we typically describe wave function, not always, but historically wave, and till this day, we typically write down wave functions with quite often with Greek characters and wave function, most common letter for using a Greek wave function is psi. So we have an initial arrow, initial state psi, and then we just a, evolve it a, a, with time. So basically we take the initial state and we multiply it by some rotation. So we multiply it by U. U is something that rotates the vector. So you go from the green arrow to a purple arrow and so on and so on. So that the action of U is to rotate, okay? So U operates on the state and rotates it. And that's why it's called an operator. It sounds sophisticated, but all it really means is you take the vector and you, the state, physical state of the system, you might put in this, because of course, in reality, the state of a system, the universe always changes. So we always evolve for good or bad. And, and basically as we do that, we basically keep rotating our state on this sphere. And that's really physical evolution. Okay, is there any questions about this so far? Okay, so, um, so now let me, I really wish I could, uh, just a second, let me, I can see what I'm showing you because I, I don't see, really see very clearly what I'm showing you. Uh, just a second, I apologize. I hope that this is not confusing to you. Uh, let me uh, do this maybe so I can see better. Sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Hope it's hope it's clear. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So sorry about this. Okay, so, so now basically, so we rotate with these, these operations, as I mentioned, these operations U, and because they sass, because they don't change the length of this, of this vector, this, they're called unitary. So just like we make rotations, rotations don't change the length of vectors. If I have a blue arrow and I rotate to a purple arrow and, and so on and so on, I don't change the fact that all of these arrows have the same length, the length being equal to the value of one. So these operations, these rotations are called unitary. And this is a very, very important thing, probably perhaps the most important thing in, in physics, because of course uh, you, you can't, the probabilities have to sum to a value one. So any possible evolution must be unitary. Of course, you know, as time progresses, our understanding of the universe changes. So we had Newton's equations and then we had quantum mechanics and so on. And we had Einstein's theory of relativity, but we, so we always update our rules because we discover things are not are more there's another deeper understanding and, and, and more precise description of nature and so on. But all these descriptions adhere to unitarity because in all of them, either trivially or non-trivially, but in all of them, some of the probabilities that we have must sum to value one, and that's fundamental, and that can give rise to really not trivial consequences. Okay, so now this, this might seem like a scary slide if you haven't seen it before, but actually it's very simple. So if the equations scare you, please bear with me. And of course, ask questions if, as well. So imagine that you have two possible states, okay? So it's a bit. And because it's quantum, we call it a qubit. And this is 
the origin of his fantasy name and so on. So we have two possible states, state zero and state one, for the lack of just imagination, let's just call it state zero and state one, just a binary bit. Now we can describe in general, state of a system, as I did, told you by now too many times, because I want to really emphasize this, as a vector. So we can describe a system as some arrow, and this arrow lives in some sphere, some, as I did told you, and it describes state of a system. In other words, if I have two possible independent states, zero and one, or so-called spin up and spin down, or whatever it is, then that vector has two components. One component is associated with it, the system being in states zero, say spin down, whatever you want to call it, and the other one being in state one, okay? And we have some linear combinations. So in general, the way we do it is we say, let's write down the system, the vector psi, as having two components. So here, here at UCI, I wrote a vector with two components, z0 and z1. So there are two complex numbers, okay? In quantum mechanics, we always typically deal with quantum numbers, with um, complex numbers, but there are two numbers, z1 and z0. And these numbers basically tell us respectively whatever probability is in being in state zero and state one. So unlike in classical physics, that I, I would be either in zero and one and that's it. In quantum mechanics, it can be partially in zero and partially in one. And that has to do with how large or how small these numbers z0 and z1 are. But importantly, because this state is normalized, because it has the length one, the sum of the squares of these absolute values of these complex numbers has to equal to one. So z0 absolute value squared plus z1 absolute value squared is equal to one. The sum of these has to be equal to one because we either be in state zero or in state one, okay? I hope that's clear. And now this is a sort of a, the actual sort of more sophisticated, complete story. So we have z, these numbers are complex, so they have a real part and they have an imaginary part, well, multiply the square root of minus one. And any point on this sphere would correspond to a state. So you have two angles, as you can see. You have an angle from a vertical axis that we typically call theta. And we have an angle in the xy plane that we call phi. And any combination of these two angles will give a point on the sphere. And any point on the sphere will correspond to two numbers, z0 and z1, which will tell us whatever corresponding probability is it will be in either one of these two states, zero and one, okay? And in a, in a sense of, of what you heard in earlier lectures and so on and cats, etc. state zero, for instance, can be the cat is dead, state one can be the cat is alive. And here we can have arbitrary points in the sphere that tell us there's some probability that the cat is alive and of course the remaining probability that the cat is dead, okay? Uh, but in reality, it's not just probability as we have the full state, we have complex numbers that tell us the so-called amplitudes that we have either that state or that state. Okay, but again, this is just a way just to really hammer that any physical system can be described by such a sphere. So here it's a really a sphere, it's a sphere in three dimension because we have two complex numbers and there's some constraints and so on. But in general, it's always even more complicated than, than this example, the minimal example of a bit, it can't be simpler than a bit. Whatever it is, it's some sphere. And whatever it is, as we evolve the system, we keep rotating the state by moving it by when we apply this unit, some operation of U that rotates the system, okay? So we can start from some initial state and can rotate to another state. And so they, you, know, so you see the two arrows here, the green arrow, the orange arrow and so on. So we just keep rotating and rotating and rotating, okay? Now, as you might know from daily life, if you rotate, and it, this is sort of simple, but actually it's very profound. And this is really the essence behind quantum mechanics, a large, not all of it, of course, in many aspects, but a very important aspect of quantum mechanics. If you take any object 
and you rotate it. When you rotate it, depending on the order of rotations, you might get different results. For instance, imagine that you have this book that you see in front of you on the top left, and you rotate it initially as described by this rotation R1. Okay, so you rotate it by 90 degrees, so it goes from being down on the table and so on to be upright on the table and so on facing towards you. Now you rotate it by another rotation by 90 degrees, and you sort of see that now you, you end up with this, what appears in the top right. Okay, so if you rotate first if R1 and then if R2, you end with a state in the top right. Suppose now you rotate first if R2, now go to the bottom row. First if R2, okay, as we did be, as around the y-axis, the same thing that you did at the end in the top row, but now you, you change your orders. You, so you rotate first around the y-axis and then around the z-axis, and then you rotate around the x-axis, then you have what you see at the bottom right. And clearly, the bottom right and the top right are very different. The order of rotations gives rise to different outcomes. So if I start with the initial, same initial state that I have at the left, it doesn't matter which row I'm looking at, top row or bottom row. If I perform these operations in sequence, the sequence, the actual ordering is very, very important, okay? And that really tells us that these operators, these rotations that we perform, really how we do it, what we do first and what we do later is crucially important. So this, uh, this, uh, this thing that the order is important and we, if we change the order, we don't get the same thing. So typically we think about numbers. So five times two is equal to two times five and so on. Or physical quantities, we, in classical physics, we, we just have units when, and after all, there's just numbers and so on. But here, it's more complicated, just numbers of units. Here, you see that if we rotate in different ways, we get different results. And this is really perhaps the most important difference between classical physics and quantum physics. So quantum physics, we rotate these vectors on the sphere and so on. But the rotations are generated by physical, ultimately by physical observables. And all observables in quantum mechanics correspond to operators. They do something on the system, okay? And their order is important. Typically, if you change your order, you'll get different results. Not always, but typically, if you have a bunch of these, op of these operators and you change how you multiply them, you're gonna get a very different result. So you have to be very, very careful, more careful than usual, when you do calculations in quantum mechanics, because the ordering is important, you cannot take it for granted at all. So I want to again to emphasize it. So if you have two operations A and B, and the operations describe physical observables in quantum mechanics, it's not equal to B times A. Okay. So these operations, for instance, what I described to you here, rotations, that's generated by so-called angular momentum, and so the angular momentum components in quantum mechanics don't commute to another. If I multiply them in different orders, I get completely different results. And similarly, if I have, as we discussed, the divine position and momentum, the momentum, these all these also don't satisfy the property that A B is equal to B A. Two times five is equal to five times two. Usually of course we just numbers. It's an axiom of course that you learn in, in elementary school and so on. But if these are now operators, it's no longer true, okay? And we have to be careful. So we operate on these states, these physical states, they're having this length one, and their ordering is important. I hope that's clear. So again, back to this cartoon. All these cartoons are not mine. I just find nice pictures on the web and so on. I try to acknowledge them, so here's. Anyway, so you sort of see that I start off with some initial state, and I rotate. So I go from initial state psi to some layer psi and some layer time t, and I get there by operating with this unitary matrix, this rotation u, okay? Now we go, and I, again, I hope this does not bother you. I mean, I just wanna get this idea across. So the, the point I wanna make is, this example maybe was not the best one I, I gave here, but the point I wanna make is that any function you think of can be written down as a vector, any function. 
So suppose you have a sequence of numbers, like one over square root of two, a half, one over two square root of two, et cetera, some infinite sequence or finite sequence, whatever it is of numbers. You can always write down as, as a function. You say, I have a function f of x, so f of n is equal to this. So if it's a discrete number, I can say f of n is equal to this, and I just give you the, the prescription for doing that, and yet you follow the recipe and you generate all these numbers and so on. Now, of course, you might put all these numbers in the big column, as you see here on the right and the bottom right. So I, one over square, I just put the value of a function at one, which is one over square root of two, the value of a function at two, which is a half, the value of a function at three, which is one over two square root of two, and so on. So I just put them in one big column, and I call that a vector. And that vector describes my system. That's a vector in, in Hilbert space. So it can be a finite dimensional vector, or it can even be, importantly, infinite dimensional. Okay, but the important thing I want to emphasize, anything that you're accustomed to, from whoever is, you know, some finite sequence of numbers, or even just a continuous function, you can always describe it in terms of such vectors. Okay, so here is a, an example of a continuous function. Okay, some function, some complicated or not so complicated function. And at any point in space, it has some value. Okay. Now you can point, you can put in some mesh on this thing and you can read off the values that you have of a function at different points and you can just put them in one big row and say, I'm, this describes a function because it's, the function is either there or there or there. So with arbitrary accuracy, you know, with increasing accuracy and make this finer and finer and finer, I can tell you the value of function at any point by just reading off its value in this big column, this big column vector. Okay, so if I want to describe a continuous function, I have to have an infinite number of entries because, of course, I have an infinite number of points. The set of all these points in the continuum is really has an infinite number of points in it. Okay, so 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 functions are also vectors, even though we typically don't, unless you use it every day. Yeah, typically we typically don't think about it in this way, but functions are also vectors. Any function you want to draw or you came across and so on x squared, x sine x, all of these functions are vectors. Now we typically, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, we typically want these in quantum mechanics and also more broadly, we want to make sure that uh, uh, these functions can be normalized. So we have, uh, okay, but, but these, are, these are technical points that maybe you should not go into too much. But the point is that any function you can think of is really a high dimensional vector. Okay, and in the case of quantum mechanics, if I have some wave function extends of all of space, I can describe it as a very, very long vector of having components that I can read off the value of the components one by one by one to tell you what is the value of a wave function any point in space. So it's really, as I mentioned, wrote here, it's the glorified bean counting. And you just read off the value of a function any point in space and you just have it there. And many of the calculations we do in quantum mechanics amount to glorified beam counting. We just look at many, many possible processes that can actually occur and we sum them up and so on. And we find out what I mentioned earlier, these amplitudes that we can actually have. And these relate to, to these entries that I have in this big, big, generally big vector. Okay. So in the continuum, we have so suppose I have continuous three-dimensional space. I have an arbitrary point in space called X vector. So just a point in space, any point you want to think about, your favorite point in space. And you can just have a, a grid of, of these, off of such points. And you can read off, the, you can put them all the values of the wave function that you have in space on this grid. And you can read off a value of the wave function, your favorite point, but just saying, I want to look at this point, particular point, X is my favorite point. What's the value of function there? So here's a cartoon again from some, somewhere else and so on. Obviously, I mentioned all these pictures are not mine. I cannot make nice pictures. But you can just read off the value of a function and that just corresponds to this entry here. So this point X here has this particular value of the, the vector psi of X here. And if I were to sum up all these psi of X's and I mean, I have to squirt, look at your absolute value, the complex numbers, and square them, and sum them up, and so on, 
in this case is an integral of and so on, but basically just sum them up, it would sum up to a value of one. Again, the probability is no that the particle, if this is a particle that's describing this wave function, the particle has to be somewhere in space. So if I sum up of all these entries, I, I square of all these entries and absolute value, and I sum them up, it has to equal to a value of one. Okay. Now, so far it might seem just like some you know, un unnecessary complication. Who needs all of this nonsense? I mean, yeah, maybe sure you can write down in terms of complicated vectors, but why is this useful? I mean, why can't we just do it in the old fashioned way? So there are some aspects which are really captured very, very importantly in quantum mechanics, which you would not see by doing it in the old fashioned way. And here's a cartoon that, one, that I'm trying to highlight this, this aspect. Suppose you have a, a state, okay, this purple arrow describes the state. It has unit length. And as you can sort of see here, I have two axes. I have an X, Y axis, and I have an X prime, Y prime axis. Both axes are equally valid. You could use one or the other. Both reference frames, if you want, they're equally valid. And of course, there are other ones you can think about. They're all equally good. I mean, they all describe reality. They can all describe this purple arrow. If I use, for instance, the XY reference frame, I, I will have some number X, some number Y. Of course, in general, there'll be some complex numbers and so on, but let's make it simple. So you have two numbers, X and Y, describing your state. If I have the other reference frame, where the basis spanned by X prime and Y prime, I'll have two other numbers, X prime, Y prime, describing the system. Now, you might say, what should I use? Does it really matter if I use this one or that one? So in reality, whatever you use, you're gonna get the same answer, but some state, some bases are much better than others, okay? And so really, if we want to understand a particular feature, we can use any one of these multiple bases and they can they all equally validly represent the same physical state, but in some cases, some of them are, are much more natural to use, especially when you do measurements. The system will so-called, as I described momentarily, will collapse to particular set of states, which will be oriented in a particular way. So you might want to use some set of states, bases over others. But again, as I, the important thing is that there's only one physical state and you can use different lenses to look at that same state. So just like if you got optometrist and so on, like I do quite often, and you want to look, or maybe not often enough, uh, and you want to sort of see, you know, should your prescription change or not change and so on. So you can say, is this better, is this worse, is better, is worse and so on. So you can only use one lens at a time. Okay, you're looking at the same state. You're looking at the same state. But some states, when you use some descriptions, some lenses, the image becomes much sharper than the other descriptions. So you're looking at the same state, but some lens give much sharper description than others, okay? And that's important. And that underlies the uncertainty relations of quantum mechanics that you might see something very, very sharply in one set of lens, but if you do that, in that lens, you cannot see something else sharply. You only see something sharply, but not another thing sharply and vice versa. So here is a cartoon of, of what I just mentioned, the uncertainty relations. And again, I apologize for those of you that either know this too well, in which case this is sort of superficial, or know this too little, in which case this might be looked sophisticated. But imagine that you have some function, okay? So the function that we're looking at is what appears here on the left-hand side. What appears in this cartoon is S of T in the time domain. It doesn't have to be time, really want to think about as a function of space, but this function that you see in blue on the left-hand side. This function in blue on the left-hand side, I can think as a sum of many, many oscillations. So I can think about the oscillation that you sort of see. The first one, that has a pretty large period, and then the small, another one has a smaller period and so on. So I can add all of these oscillations together, all of these sine waves together, to form what you see on the left as written as S of T in your time domain. So that's the representation of your system. So you can write down the time domain, you can write down the values of a function S or what I wrote F at different locations. I just, as this bean counting I mentioned earlier, just read off what it is at any given moment in time 
or what I really want to think about here is in space. Any given value that I have along this horizontal axis, I can read off what the value of a function is. And I can write down in one big, infinitely long column vector. But I can also, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, write down the sum of these sinusoidal waves, which basically means in formal language, in terms of writing down in terms of a Fourier basis, a Fourier transform. You write with what FFT means, but it's a fancy way of just saying that you write it down in terms of sine waves and so on. It has many applications and Fourier really highlight that and it's very important, but in much research research is just a glorified name for these sine waves. So we can write down what we see on the left in terms of combinations of these sine waves, in which case we have spikes. So we have one spike corresponding to a particular frequency or particular value of K, if I think about this as a real space image, for the system that has a particular oscillation, another one that has never oscillation and so on, okay? So the one that has a long wavelength, has a small value of a wave number or small frequency if it's time, that, that has a big amplitude, has a big spike. The other one has a smaller spike, it has a smaller weight and so on. And if I sum them all together, I'm gonna to get the same function. So the same function can be cast either in real space or real time as f of x1, x2, x3, blah, 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 and so on. Or equivalently, I can write it in the Fourier basis as some of these oscillations, in which case it becomes f of these so-called wave numbers, these sine waves, so this f of k, k1, k2, k3, and so on. And they both describe the same thing. No one is better than the other, they're both right. If somebody would, when we had an exam and somebody would give this answer, somebody would give that answer, both students would give the right answer. I mean, as long as they give the right numbers and so on. They both describe the same physical state. So these are two different lenses, two different lenses to describe the same system. Either we work in X basis, in real time, or, or where we want to think about this real space, or I want to think about it in terms of Fourier basis, okay? But I have a problem. So I, I, I can work only with one or the other. If I work with what I have of a function at all points in space or all points in time, I just have one presentation of it, okay? And I, and I represent my vector in that basis, and, okay? And I use that lens and I represent in that basis, or I have a new basis. And then I have represented now in, in the Fourier space. But I can only choose one of the bases. I cannot work together in both. And that's essentially the origin of uncertainty relations. You can work with one basis or another basis. Both bases describe completely the system. But you cannot work with both at the same time. You cannot work with two lenses at the same time. You either have to work with one or the other, okay? So this is the thing I want to emphasize. So the system, the basis we choose is not unique. We can work with a basis which is a position basis, work with a basis which is a Fourier basis or the physics would be the momentum basis, but not both at the same time. And that's, as I repeat myself, because I want to emphasize this, the origin of the circulation. Okay, so some things are sharper than others. So if I have a sharp image for the position, will be blurry for the momentum. If I, have, if I know what the location of a particle is quite very accurately, then this momentum is very blurry. I don't know what the momentum is and vice versa. If I know how fast a particle is moving quite accurately, I can only, I can only measure so accurately, of course, but I know it very, very accurately, then its position becomes uncertain fundamentally because of its geometry. It has nothing to do with measurement devices and spookiness and so on. It's just because of the geometry. You have to choose one frame or the other. So here's never a cartoon of that. Again, as I mentioned, all these pictures are not mine, but again, the same, the same feature. We have some function, what you see on the right-hand side, the red curve. You can write it down in real space as a big column vector, or you can write it down as some of all these Fourier modes, all these sine waves, they all, they all sit perfectly. You can work with one or the other, but you cannot work with both at the same time. Now here is really the more quantitative aspect of this feature. So if you have a function which is narrow, so it has a sharply defined value in position. 
So it's not blurring position, it's sharply defined. Then momentum in Fourier space is broad and vice versa. If I have a state that's very broad, so what you have on the left-hand side in the top, what's called broad wave packet. If it's very, very broad in real space, then it's very narrow in K space, okay? So one or the other. If it, I mean, or my perspective, if it's very narrow in K space, it can be, and typically is, very broad in real space. It doesn't follow actually that if it's broad in real space, it has to be narrow in K space, okay? But this relation that you can only, if one is, if one is sharp, the other is narrow, is the basic events answer duration. Now, now this might seem a bit formal. So here is a more cart a cartoon, which is a bit more perhaps daily life. Suppose that you are driving and you stop at the stop at the stoplight, and you are turning on your your lights because you're turning right or left and so on, and you see the car in front of you, and it seems like both of you, your blinkers, your lights are going on at the same time, the same frequency, in sync. But if you wait long enough, it might you actually see that your your light has a different frequency than, than the driver in front of you and so on. So in other words, you can have two oscillations. So what you see in front of you, say in front of you, let's say the black curve that you see on top, U is the bottom curve that you see in red. And initially you might be in sync with that driver. So you, your, your signal is exactly the same, blinking in the same, seemingly the same times as the driver in front of it. But you wait long enough, if there's a small difference of frequencies, then at some stage you'll be completely out of phase. So when your light is off, then the other driver's light is on and vice versa. So if you wait long enough at a traffic light, you will see that you're not in sync with a driver in front of you. In other words, your frequency and his, his or her frequency are different. But to do that, you have to wait long enough at the traffic light to actually see and to compare your frequencies. So you have to wait long in time to see differences in in, in frequencies. And similarly, you can do the same thing in space. You have to have things which are long in space to see, really re to resolve more accurately differences associated with different wave numbers and so on. Okay. So if you have to want to have the accurate measurement of a frequency or momentum, or wave number, you have to wait, you have to have a long, you have to have the value of functions for a long distance span that you have of, of x values. And if you want to do it for frequencies, you have to do it for a long interval of time. Okay, but again, I, I want to emphasize this point. You can completely represent a system either in position or in momentum, but not in both. Okay, it turns out in quantum mechanics, now we quantum mechanics, time is special. So the uncertain relations involving time, the relative of Fourier transform, as I described it, but they're actually fundamentally different from those in associated with space because time in quantum mechanics is not an operator, it's just time. So it's a bit different. And actually this is a common mistake quite many people actually might make. Now, what about a measurement? I mentioned that if you make a measurement, the system will so-called collapse. This is a, not my word, this is a word that's been used for decades. So from, exper from experiment, on experiments, from experience, when you measure, and this is one of the unusual things about quantum mechanics, it's mysteries and so on. If you measure an observable, any observable, then all of a sudden, so it seems, it will collapse to one of a few possible states. So if you measure its position, if you have a particle, the particle can be like a wave. I mean, if you, electrons can interfere with themselves and so on, as I described in the last lecture. But if you measure its location, you have some screen and so on, you have to measure its location, then you will see it strikes the screen at one particular point. And when it strikes the screen at one particular point, it behaves as a point particle, as a well-defined location. So it collapses, so you measure the location X, and now the value of X is certain. It collapsed a particular value of X. Okay, so now the lens involving a position, if you measure position, is very, very sharp. You know exactly where it is, up to incredible accuracy. But now you're, of course, blurry in other things because now you your state is, is oriented along this axis in Hilbert space, some axis, but it can have multiple components, mixed components along other axes, which in other bases, which are not so obvious. Okay. So if you measure one thing, it can become accurate, but then other quantities can become completely inaccurate. 
Okay, I hope that's clear. And in particular, in the context of momentum and, and position, as I mentioned, I want to emphasize this and repeat myself on purpose. If you measure a position, then position becomes certain as, as, as much as you can to, to mix incrementally, but the momentum becomes non-defined. I mean, I mean, really very, very broad. In Fourier space, we have this broad wave packet that we described earlier, and vice versa. If I measure momentum, the velocity essentially of a particle very, very accurately, then its position is inaccurate. And there are many examples. I gave you an example of, of waiting in traffic light. You can think about examples of radar signals that you send off and bounce off planes and so on. Many, many examples. But this is as a feature of the Fourier transforms that we have in position momentum. And more generally, this is a feature beyond just Fourier transforms. This is a feature of geometry. That if you, you can have a state, a vector, which is oriented along one direction, but if it's oriented along one direction with an upper basis, which have random angles relative to it, then they can have multiple components and it's really ill-defined, it's a sort of blurry. Okay, so if I have a wave function, say this green hill that you see here on the left, I can write down these glorified vectors I mentioned earlier, the values, the components along this vector, the output value squared correspond to the probabilities. And if I measure the probability, if I measure the location, then all of a sudden what will happen is that the system will have a value of one somewhere and zero everywhere else, okay? So the position is certain, but then the momentum is completely uncertain. So the system collapsed to a well-defined state, okay? The same thing with this qubit I described earlier. So you have two possible states, let's say the zero and the one, two independent states. If you measure the state of a qubit, you're going to get zero or one. So it collapses. So it can be some arbitrary state that you have in here in purple on the sphere. But once you measure the state, it's going to be either what you have in blue or in red, not anything else. So it collapses immediately, or so we think, to one of these two states. And the probability of collapsing to zero or one has to do with the components that I, I mentioned earlier, this vector. So the the first component squared its absolute value tells you the probability that you are in zero. Second component squared in absolute value tells you the probability that you're in state one. So the sine squared and cosine squared, which of course, as you might remember, is sum to value of one as a must because, I mean, of course, geometry they must sum to value of one, but also physically, the probability of being, assuming any one of the possible states has to sum to value of one. But initially, before you measure the state, it's unknown. And there's some probability that you measure, you have this or that, depending on what the state is. After you measure it, it's either zero or one, and that's it. So it's very sharply defined. There's no, if, if you measure it again, it will be exactly the same state. It's not, not funny business. But before you measure it, it can be either this or that. Same with the Schrodinger's cat. It can be dead or alive. But after you measure it, you find it's alive, then it's alive. If you measure it again, it's still alive. It's not going to change. Okay, but importantly, that we have in quantum mechanics is probabilities. So before we make a measurement, there are probabilities that we have a particular value for what we'll actually measure. And probabilities, of course, imply uncertainty because if everything were certain, there would be no probability. We just know what's going to happen. There's no, no need to think about probabilities, everything is obvious. So we have a probability distribution, and that means we have uncertainties. Okay, and that's really a fundamental feature of quantum mechanics. The existence of probabilities because we have these big vectors and so on. And the vectors typically don't have values which are trivial, but typically have many, many components which are non zero. And they can have a standard deviation which is not zero, like many, many possible outcomes. So after you make a measurement, the state of the system is well defined. It's just, okay, it goes to one of a few possible number of states. But before you make that, it can be anything. So after you make a measurement, it's, it has a well-defined value of one for a particular value of states that you can actually assume. But before that, it a priori can be anything, unless you told something else about the system. And this uncertainty is of course important and you know it from, from many things that you encountered in the past. For instance, all of the chemistry, as you see here at the periodic table, of course, on top right, top left, I'm sorry, is of course, Rationalized in terms of what I found, of course, many, many years ago, and we understand in terms of Bohr's 
mar 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 atom and so on. And we have all these wave functions, okay? And one S state, two S state, three S state, and what you all learned in high school and so on. And all of these different wave functions correspond to probabilities that you have different locations of electron around the nucleus, okay? So, so here you see on the, on the right-hand side, the probability that you actually are a particular distance away, essentially. It's not something very, very sharp. I mean, it's not infinitely sharp. It always has some width, okay? And of course, so wave functions of electrons that we have are very important for thinking about reactions, thinking about biology, thinking about how we can have confirmations of proteins. And so how we can also have docking when we actually develop drugs and so on, because we want something to dock onto. And so like a lock and key mechanism and so on. So these are very, very important things. Now, typically quite often people say quantum mechanics is only for very, very small things. And that's correct to a zero for approximation. Atoms are small and, and it's because we look at atoms that we find weird things and so on. But actually it's not, as a matter of fact, true. Even on a very, very large scales, you can have quantum phenomena. For instance, suppose you have a crystal, okay? A crystal is a periodic arrangement of atoms. Because it's periodic, what you would have had for a single atom or a few atoms, by virtue of it being periodic, is now magnified and appears on a very big scale, it can be in the scale of meters. And this is important. So for instance, imagine that you have atoms very, very far apart. Individual atoms have the usual atomic levels, S, P, etc. Now imagine that you make them closer and closer to each other in some periodic fashion. What happens is that you will develop so-called bands, electronic bands. These electronic bands have their genesis, if I think about it in terms of making the atoms closer to each other in, from electronic levels in hydrogen-like atoms. I mean, of course, not necessarily hydrogen-like, but, but what you would have for atoms. And these levels that become these bands are how we understand whether we have insulators or metals, so if there's, there's so-called the band gap between these, these bands, is an insular. If there's no band gap, it's a metal. If a band gap is small, but it's not zero, it's, it's semiconductor, which we use all around us, and of course in our computers and our cell phones and so on. So, and all of that is quantum mechanics on the big scale, because we have atoms that repeat periodically, and we have these bands that we can understand what they do by ge just generalizing what we have from atomic levels. Now for other phenomena, which are more, which are sort of more mysterious, or perhaps an amazing, like for instance, superfluid helium. So if you call helium be below four Kelvin, so very, very low temperatures, so just four degrees Celsius above absolute zero, then it becomes an ambient pressure and so on. It becomes a fluid. If you call it below that, so around two Kelvin, it, it becomes, part of it becomes a superfluid. And the superfluid can actually do weird things. It can actually climb up walls. It can have these fountain effects and so on. If you heat it up and you have some plug that doesn't let normal fluid go through, superfluid itself can actually go in a fountain and so on. So here, what happens is the system can be described as a combination as a usual fluid, a normal fluid, and a so-called superfluid. The superfluid is basically behaves like some particular wave function. And it does really use all of these unusual things. And the superconductors, of course, have some many similarities. Now, another thing which is very unusual about quantum mechanics, having to do again with probabilities, is tunneling. So in quantum and classical mechanics, of course, I, I have, I'm either here or there or there, I'm in a particular location. If, I hit, if I'm running against a wall, I'm gonna hit the wall and I'm gonna get a big headache. In quantum mechanics, if you take something and you, send it through some so-called barrier, depending on how, what energy that you actually send it through and so on, some of it will go back, but some of it actually might go through. So it'll be some reflection as you see on the left. So it's an incident wave you see on the left-hand side on the bottom. Some of it will be reflected. Some of it will go through. This part of it goes through even when the energy of your initial state is smaller than that of a barrier, is called tunneling. You can tunnel through this barrier. And this is not some weird stuff. I mean, it's a weird stuff, 
but it's actually very, very useful for many things, for tunnel diodes and so on. But also, and so for real, for, you know, for humans, for doing this is really, of course, the, the probability of that is happening is essentially non-existent. But in many cases, it's really something which is really important. So here's a, again, a cartoon of that. I mean, here I can do right where the picture is from, actually, I should have done that. But here you sort of see that um, there's a wave coming from the left. It strikes a barrier. Some of it goes back. This red arrow was reflected back, but some of it makes it through. This is what you have, this phi free, the green arrow, it makes it through. So it can tunnel through the barrier. We do the same thing for molecules and the same thing for solids. You can actually have something that's called scanning the tunnel microscope. You can actually go through over your crystal and you can actually look through what happens in different locations. And you can send a current through a vacuum. You actually have to overcome some barrier. You can have to tunnel through. And you can use that to measure locations of atoms very, very accurately on the surface and also move them around, okay? The same thing also appears for nuclear processes. For instance, if you have a decay, get alpha decay. So you, okay, so you, you basically emit a nucleus, the helium atom. You have to overcome some barrier, okay? And so that, process doesn't happen automatically by itself, but it can happen by tunneling. There's always some probability of that happening. So even if the probability might be low, it still happens. For instance, in our sun, we have fusion, okay, which we hope to recreate one day in a controlled fashion, not in bombs, but in a controlled fashion to actually power everything we need. But importantly, uh, in the sun, we, again, we have a barrier. The temperature is not that high, but it happens automatically. It's very high. Don't get me wrong, of course. But still, we had a tunnel from some barrier. But because the sun is so massive and so big, even if only a small fraction of the particles actually make it through the barrier, that's enough to actually create all the heat and so on that, we, that it emits. OK? So here, we also have tunneling. And it's, of course, on a very, very big scale. OK, so again, all of this has to do with representation that we have of vectors in the quantum mechanics that represent states and how they evolve. And they evolve unitarily as rotations. So this geometry we represent the state with. The same thing can be also done classically. So people also found you could do the same thing to describe also classically. I don't want to get into that, of course. It's not. Now, one last point, and I apologize for this dense slide. I mean, a few last points. In quantum mechanics, there's a very, very important constant, which is called Planck's constant, invented by Planck. So this is called, typically known by H. Now, Planck's constant control everything that essentially is quantum mechanical. Okay, it's a natural quantum scale. It doesn't mean that the effects of quantum mechanics are small. They can, be, they can occur in very big scales, and very high energy scale, and very low energy scales, and so on. But H bar is, H divided by two pi, a constant divided by two pi. It's a very, very small number. You see it's 10 to the minus 33 joule seconds, or if you want something more mundane, it's really 10 to the minus 33 meters squared kilogram per second. To, to make it actually more physical to, to us, if you think about a, a car with typical mass, slowly turning around the curve, and you ask, what's the angular momentum that you would have in that car? If you plug in typical numbers, you would find this of the order of 100,000 to a million meter squared kilogram per second. Planck's constant is 10 to the minus 33 meters squared kilograms per second. So it's the order of 10 to the power 40. So one of 40 zeros times less than the angular momentum that you have when you drive in your car and then make it turn around the curve and so on. So it's a really, really small number. Okay, but it doesn't mean it's not important. So as I described to you, you, you have stars and so on and their emission has to do with, with quantum effects, the, the colors that we see around us have to do with quantum effects. We can, we, we very, also what was we cannot see in ultraviolet and infrared and so on. That's actually where quantum mechanics started, actually started from. Also ideal gases, they started in chemistry and so on. You can measure you can, the entropy very precisely and actually Planck's constant appears here. Now, if I think about what I told you that A, B is not equal to B, A, remember I told you it's a, a very important facet of quantum mechanics. In terms of position and momentum, so if you have position X, momentum P, if you change your order of position and momentum, X, P, position X to momentum P, 
vis-a-vis -vis position P times times it's position P times. Long. Yeah, right. Sorry. Is the question? Was it a question? I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is. Could you define measurement a little more clearly? At, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, 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 so uh, that actually will require me to to uh, spend some more time in it. I'll, I'll try to give you some flavor of it. I'm actually going a little bit over time. Yeah, but typically when you make a measurement, what happens is that you, as I mentioned, collapse to a state, and that state is a, a so-called eigenstate of of what you measure. So it's one of the, some number of possible states, which are sort of so-called self-states, eigenstates of what you actually measure. If I were to translate it from original German. Uh, yeah. I, I, so it, so, it, so it's, uh, it goes to special states. It goes to states in which you, what you actually measure has, has an uncertainty zero, a variance of zero. But then for other things, the uncertainty is not zero, of course. Can change, can be can come even much larger, as in the case of, of momentum. If you measure the location, if you were able, of course you cannot. But if you were able to measure the location precisely with absolute determination, then the uncertainty of momentum would be infinite. So because a b is not equal to b a, because x times p is not equal to p times x, this value of h bar that determines how large this difference is, is what appears in the uncertainty relation. So the uncertainty in position. The second equation you see in front of you, delta x on certain position times uncertainty momentum, the variance in momentum, can never ever be smaller than h bar, this like constant divided by two pi, divided by two, never. Okay, now classically, we don't have h bar. Classically, we have a, b is equal to b, a. So classically, h bar goes to zero. And it's not a bad approximation because h bar, that I showed you, is a really a tiny number. But still, it can be quite profound and important as it is. Now, in quantum mechanics, we typically, another way, of think, well, many ways, equivalent ways of thinking about quantum mechanics. One way, which is popularized by Feynman, is that you think about many, many possible processes and you sum their amplitudes together. So basically, what you do is you say, F is an initial state. I want to go to some final state. And to find out, that so-called amplitude, that number, which tells the probability, if you square it, you have to sum over all possible paths that you can actually undertake. And for each path, you have to have some phase. You have to have a number e raised to, which is basically cosine plus i sine, which is like a vector of unit length that you have in the complex plane. And with an angle, or what you can is, is, is so-called the, act, the action, which determines on the path. So basically for each path, so maybe I'm giving it words which don't make much sense unless you heard them before, of course. For each possible path that you actually can undertake, there'll be some contribution. And that contribution would be determined crucially by the value of h bar, okay? When h bar goes to zero, there'll be only one important path. So you have classical mechanics. There's no probabilities, it's just really well-defined. I mean, you just, if you knew everything about the system, it was well-defined. It's going to do one thing and that's it. But if you have a fine value of h bar, there's some spread of possible paths you can actually take. And things become more fuzzy. Now, this can also be related to what you have in sort of daily life, or not so daily life. Suppose you actually were a lifeguard and somebody is drowning and you can run much faster on land than in the water. How would you actually run to save that swimmer? Would you just run a straight line? Would you run first more on land because you're faster running than swimming? What would you do? It turns out that the path that you would actually take would correspond to a path that minimizes its length of time, of course. And minimizing its length of time would correspond to a path which quantum mechanically would correspond to having the smallest variation in this phase. So I have, I'm running out of time, but the point is, if you were to look at the phases that you have for each possible process that you have, say, a photon, a particle of light that comes out of here and wants to go there and so on, and want to minimize the time, the time, the, the way that actually light travels 
the dominant way it actually travels is by minimizing its time of flight. So basically you have some refraction that occurs in the certain interface. And this refraction is governed by so-called, this is Fermat's principle, the same famous Fermat. And you, you have Snell's law, which arises when you want to minimize the path. So if you have, were trying to save a swimmer, you would actually run to, on land and then you actually change your angle to reach a swimmer. And those angles would satisfy the same angles that appear when you have a light that refracts the surface. Exactly the same thing. Now I, I, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go too, even though I have some, lots of material, but I should not hold you because it's unfair of me. So let me just end by saying that uh, light is of, of course a quantum, and this was discovered originally as a mathematical trick. He didn't actually believe it himself by Planck, who introduced Planck's constant. And he also used a Boltzmann constant as well, even though he called it Boltzmann constant. And that resolved many, many paradoxes. And light is also, of course, a wave, as you're from soap bubbles, from microwaves, from microwaves, of course, the rotating plate and so on, because you have standing waves inside. So in order not to heat this, your food only at some particular points, you typically rotate it on, the, on this plate. So you, the wave actually reaches all the points, hopefully uniformly, and you heat it up and so on. So waves, I mean, so light and microwaves and ultraviolet and so on, they're all around us, a really wave, but there are also particles. And these particles of light and also waves have a polarization as in your sunglasses. And if they're polarized, of course, so this is a cart on the left here, bottom left, you sort of see, looking at the water on the left with out the polarizer, that's A and B with a polarizer. And when you have a polarizer, you basically remove what actually the glare that actually comes back. When it comes back, it's polarized. And you can use that to do experiments. So basically, sunglasses are basically a quantum measurement device. And if you put sunglasses in a row, you can actually reproduce one of quantum mechanics' most important experiments, which is the Bell's inequalities. But I'm running out of time, so I probably should stop here. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to elaborate on them. But the important, so basically I just want, so you know, this is Bell's inequality, I don't have time to describe that. Uh, but basically, the uh, thing I want to emphasize, so quantum mechanics follows from geometry. We represent states in terms of geometry in Hilbert space. So we have lengths and we have angles. And we associate to the sizes that we have of the components. If I square them and absolutely look at absolute value, that was the probabilities. Coming back to your question, but without much detail as yet, if I make a measurement, I project my system along certain directions, which are associated with what I mentioned, which is a technical term, but I have to ask you, which is the eigenstates that you have of what you're actually measuring. The theory is counterintuitive, but, but actually it's probably the most accurate theory we have in the universe to date. And this is everywhere. So it appears in physics and chemistry and biology, Bash, and also, of course, in engineering, transistor is basically was built and designed because we have the structure of solids and so on. What I have not discussed and, and is actually these ideas from, from quantum mechanics are related to quantum information and they're very useful. So for instance, many new algorithms in machine learning actually have been inspired by what people have used in quantum information, so-called tensor networks and things like that. Now, also in previous lectures, people have mentioned, some of the previous lectures have mentioned entanglement. Entanglement is something which is really inherently quantum, but doesn't mean it's not all around us. For instance, when you formalize a system, it actually, that formalization, it has this, it basically looks grand and it's, it's in equilibrium with the surroundings. Being in the equilibrium with the surroundings basically means it's entangled with the surroundings. And that can be made precise. I mean, people also think about there's a black holes and things like that, but also in daily life, if you formalize the new equilibrium for your surroundings, that means that you're entangled with your surroundings. And this, of course, goes on and on, but I should stop here because I'm already going way over time. So thank you very much. So let me. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, unmute yourself and, and ask those. So any questions? Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, and the the time is short, and uh, I would not ask you for uh, giving us the Bell theorem and, and polarizers, but is it possible to get um, the recording of all of this, including the charts that you did not go oh, over? Oh, oh, 
okay. I, so if you, so for those of you who want to hear it, I can actually go beyond that after the usual questions. So, because I don't want to take okay. time. Okay. Okay. So I can do yes. that after the usual questions. And I'll be happy. Okay. To Good. Answer. Absolutely. So thank you for asking. Are there other questions that any of you have? So I, uh, I I've, got a, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, it seemed at one point I was having. I've got my my most of my training in uh, education is in mathematics. And it seemed like there was a point where you you were discussing uh, you know x one x two this this vector this vector yeah uh, and it almost seemed like you were making a there was a problem between countably and uncountably infinite sets uh, for instance if you keep you know you can't get all the elements of an uncountable set just by going point by point even if there's an infinite number of them. yes this is correct so but 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 the point is. Imagine that you could still do that. So imagine that you, even if you had an uncountable set, imagine that you, you would just discretize it with arbitrary precision. So imagine, so imagine that you have this, even say from zero to one, and you go in steps of delta x, and say, okay, I, I now go in steps of delta x is equal to one tenth, and I have now ten elements, so and so on. And now I'm going steps of a hundred, and I have a hundred elements, and so on. So I, as I make delta x smaller and smaller and smaller, I, I can describe more and more accurately the function. At the, so it will always be discrete representation. I completely agree with you. But it, when I do this finer and finer and finer, ultimately I will approach what happens in the continuum. So a function can be thought of as the limiting process of okay. such a grid, and that's how we plot it. And that, but of course, your question is very well taken. Uh, and, and people actually, including some of my best friends, actually do think about these questions and, and also what happens if you don't define it, if it not over, say, the complex plane, but actually think about the discrete numbers and so on. So these are profound questions. Uh, but yeah, in terms of actual calculations, this is how you can actually think about it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, any other questions that any, any might, 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 might. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. There are no silly questions, of course. <clears throat> One more question, if you yeah. don't mind. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so we know we know a fair amount then about quantum mechanics and so forth. What will be the, and I know this is a wild uh, off, but I mean, yeah. what are the, the things you foresee as us learning and uh, breakthroughs on account of our, uh, our new knowledge of quantum uh, physics and mechanics so far. Yes, of course, I, as you said, I, I cannot say it. And, and any person that you ask will tell you his or her own favorite things and so on, and, and, or beliefs. But many things, and, and to my mind, many things, of course, everybody agrees, many things remain completely un ill understood. Um, so we, uh, for instance, I mean, I'm biased to what I'm actually re researching in. So for instance, I, what I and my friends look at are quantum effects on, on large scales typically. So solids and fluids and things like that. And so we describe the quantum, we describe the behavior of crystals very, very well. And of course, many things still in illness. So for instance, superconductivity at high temperatures is a mystery, is largely a mystery. And, and many other things are, are, are really ill understood. And also new materials have been discovered and so on. And we want to have more efficient algorithms for uh, doing calculations for large systems. And so but also what I'm really fascinated by are amorphous systems, how to combine description amorphous systems, like glasses, for instance, with quantum mechanics. And that, so that's my own niche. Uh, uh, but in general, there, there's a synergy between quantum mechanics in many fields. So for instance, quantum mechanics and machine learning, so quantum information, how do we, because to describe, for instance, the quantum state of a system, you need much more information than classically. Classically, you, if you have, let's say, you know, 30 so-called spins and so on, or, or let's say I've got this number of, of molecules and so on, you, you need a lot of information, of course, but it's just scales as, it is associated naturally with a number of particles or spins that you have. When you have quantum mechanics, you can have superpositions. So that makes it much more complicated. And you have many, many more possible states that you can actually should examine. You don't know which positions to actually look at, a priori and so on. For instance, if you have, let's say, a, a, a so-called a quantum spin system, I didn't really describe it, but suppose you have like a zero and one that I described earlier. Classically, you just have zeros and ones in different locations. But quantum mechanically, you can superpose these different states of zeros and ones. 
So you can have many, many such, such combinations. And what combination is actually really the important, combination is really the important one, it's very hard to find out. And so people do is if you try to find the algorithms to compress information, they do the calculations more efficiently. And this gave rise to things like so-called tensor networks, which are used a lot now also in machine learning. To, to what kind of network? Uh, tensor networks, tensor. So that's an inspiration. Uh, so basically you, you try to encode the system in terms of products of tensors. So, uh, of matrices and you think, look at your trace and so on. Oh, tensors, okay. Ten tensors, 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 tensors yeah. yes. Uh -huh. So there's a way of trying to encode it. And it turns out it's an efficient way of, nobody really knows exact, there are theorems, but still it's, it's it much remains to be understood why it works so well and so on, but it works very well. Uh, also there's a deep relations between, this, say, formalization and machine at the entity N in quantum mechanics. And people try to relate this also to black holes and so on. And, Things people look at in string theory, inspired by string theory. How do you have formalization in black holes, paradoxes that you have there, and so on. Scrambling information, scrambling times, and things like that. So those are things people work on today. Of course, but of course, nobody can predict the future. Uh, so I, I don't know. And of course, many people feel that quantum mechanics is really not the last word. Uh, which of course we, nobody really knows if it's the last word or not. But it's very, it's remarkably accurate. So. It, it's very, in, ter in terms of practicality, it works very, very well. And it's, any test we actually made to it, it passed that test. There's nothing that it actually didn't satisfy that we measured. Even people measured, for instance, stars, uh, light from stars hundreds of years ago and, and so on to make measurements with that, and it still works remarkably accurately. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, I cannot answer your question. But, but also- no, no, uh, that's I, a fine, that's fine, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a question going back from like the first lecture, if I could. I, I don't want to dominate it. And there are okay, other so, questions. Yeah, I mean, if there are questions, I mean, other people can ask. And if not, of course, you will, you're more than welcome to ask. Are there other questions people have? Anybody else has? Well, okay, okay I, I guess, yeah, yeah go, go, go ahead. Yeah. Well, from one of the first lectures, I asked a question about uh, the entangled photons. So yeah. we see some photons from outer space. Yeah. And we can entangle those. Yeah. So that someone at another observation point can view it uh, simultaneously, ostensibly, I guess, and, yeah. Yeah. and get a different view. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, how do you get that photon that you've entangled to be way out at that other point? Uh, yeah, so, so I don't do these experiments. I don't know all the details at all, to say the least. Okay. But I, I do know a little bit from reading about it. So, I mean, so you have light coming in from stars, you use beam splurs, for instance, in the, and you, you entangle photons. So people think of entangled photons coming from stars or from the sun with photons that they have in the lab and so on. Uh, yeah, but it many, quite often relies on beam splitters and, and, and there are different and various architectures. But I don't do it myself, so I cannot say anything. And I, especially okay. I don't want to say correct, so I apologize. All right. Thank you. No, you're welcome. So I, I, I guess I don't, I, I guess if any other question anybody has, please unmute yourself. And if not, I don't want to force you to ask questions. And I really appreciate the mute uh, coming quite a good virtual here. And for those of you who are interested, I'll, I'll go over in more detail Bell's theorem with polarizers. Those of you who don't, don't of course, want to hear this and because I talked for a long time, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming. Uh, okay, so so I guess for those of you who want to listen to the rest, let me go over what I didn't really cover, which is a light as a wave and, 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 and also um, entanglement. So basically, uh, okay, let me just sort of mention this in passing and then I'll really talk about the, um, the Bell's inequalities. So if you have a so bubble or any other film film bubbles, you can also sometimes have see an oil slick and so on and, and you can sort of see different colors. So that phenomenon of seeing the different colors and so on is an, a consequence of light being wave. So basically you have light waves coming through that can reflect at the first interface that you have, say, between the air and the soap bubble, or a second interface, it can go through and then, 
And then these two waves, waves you combine, where if they combine constructively or destructively, they, if they, they come completely in phase, and so it's enhanced or out of phase, it's destroyed. That gives rise to the different bands of colors. And if it becomes thicker, like if you have a soap bubble, bubble which becomes thicker at the bottom in SWAM, then in such a case, actually, uh, you really see more colors altering more and more rapidly. Okay, so now this thing is really a consequence, and now this is important for Bell's inequality, that light has features which are those of waves. You could never have that from particles. So Newton, for instance, originally thought about light as particles. But for particles, if you just think only of, of particles, particles can, they only add up, okay? I mean, you cannot have particles of different colors and somehow destroy each other, okay? But if you have waves, waves can appear of different, the wave is just like a sine or cosine wave. It can have a different, it can be positive or negative. So when you add them together, it can cancel. So this is really a consequence of being a wave. And also, as I mentioned, we know from daily life, microwaves and so on. You always have this mesh in front of you to protect yourself from the radiation from the microwave. You can see your food and all that. You're a standing wave inside the, the microwave. And of course, the microwaves are of order of centimeters. They're sort of pretty big. And they, of course, feed up your food and so on. Now, coming back to Ashiv, the Bellagas experiment. So imagine that you have polarized sunglasses. Okay, so what this means is that you have light. And the light initially comes with many, many possible polarizations. So you have, in vacuum, you have two independent possible polarizations. What happens when you have a polarizer, when the light passes the polarizer, it will be pa polarized only along one direction, okay? So that's why sunglasses with polarizers don't show you what the glare, because when light comes back from striking the roads or water and so on, or from other cars and so on, that comes polarized, but if you, polar, if you have polarized sunglasses, your polarized sunglasses will filter that out, okay? So you don't see that glare and you can drive and you, uh, more easily and, and you don't have to worry about it or you don't worry about it as much. Okay, it's more complicated because it's, it, it's, there's always some component of the you've got the Brewster's angle and so on, but that's essentially what actually happens. So this is a polarized wave. This is, I mean, this is basically a light wave. It has electromagnetic fields, it, it goes, this way with a big arrow. And magnetic electric field there a lot transfers at nine degrees to the direction of propagation. And the direction of electric field is called polarization direction because it electric field polarizes in molecules and so on. So if you go through a polarizer, and after you pass through polarizers, you see on the left hand side here, the system is completely has a unique direction. So it's polarized in this case vertically. Okay. Now, here is basically a description of Bell's experiment. And the, the cartoon that I always take from other places. So this is from this three blue, one brown, they have very nice cartoons and very nice images and so on. Anyway, I mean, so here you have a, a, a way, here you have, imagine you have a photon. You have your sunglass, polarized sunglasses, and you basically light beam is basically composed of many, many photons, particles of light. Now, as the, as the particles of light strike a polarizer, there are two possible outcomes. It's like a measurement. Either they can make it through a polarizer or they can't. You cannot make it partially through a polarizer. It's either it's a yes or no question. It, it collapses. It either goes through its one state or doesn't go through its another state. Okay, it's a quantum particle. So here you can see on the right-hand side, it makes it through and, and you sort of see that you have something appear on the right-hand side here. Now, suppose now you have not one, but a few polarizers. Suppose you have not one, but let's say three different sunglasses that you can put in a row. If you were to put the sunglasses, suppose you have two sunglasses with a polarizer and you put them at nine degree angles to each other, then nothing will pass through. Why? Because initially after you pass the first polarizer, you're vertically polarized, other polarizer only looks for horizontally polarized light. And of course there is none, so you'll see nothing. Suppose now you, you twist your sunglasses, your two sunglasses to an angle of 45 degrees. As it turns out what happens in that case is that half of, half of the light will make it through. So 50% will, will be bounced back. I mean, it will not make it through and half will make it through. 
Okay, it goes as basically as a cosine squared of the angle. So cosine squared of 45 degrees is, is the amplitude of the is cosine, and in, in, in quantum mechanics, we look at the amplitude squared. It's so a cosine squared of 45 degrees, which is a half, of course. Suppose now you have three sunglasses, okay? And you put them at zero degrees, as you see in the top left, at, at, at the top here. Zero degrees relative to the vertical, or any axis, but let's imagine it's vertical. 22.5 degrees relative to that vertical, and 45 degrees, okay? Now what happens? Now, because it behaves as a cosine squared, if you, if you plug in the numbers, you find out that cosine squared of 22.5 degrees is very close to 0 0.85. So basically 15% of the light will be blocked at the first polarizer. And then another 15% will be blocked in the second polarizer. So in other words, now when you put counterintuitively, when you put something in between A and C, between the two polarizers, you actually have more light. And that's the essence behind basically Bell's, and the, the unusual thing about behind Bell's inequalities. Well, I'll, I'll explain to you what Bell's inequalities are momentarily. But the point is, this is counterintuitive. It's not what you would think for having usual probabilities because you filter out more things, right? Every time you have, you have a polarizer, you filter out only light polarizers in some, some direction. How can it be when you filter out something that you get more light? It makes no sense. So that is something really counterintuitive, which really highlights these aspects of quantum mechanics about measurement and so on. So you measure what part of the light is along a polarizer direction, and somehow mysteriously, by making more measurements, more light passes through. Even though you would think you'd actually go to filter more, the opposite happens. Suppose now you want to and now this is really Bell's, idea, Bell's ideas. So he had a very influential paper in 1964, which was largely overlooked at the time, but then later on was really realized to, to be revolutionary and, and really changed our understanding of quantum mechanics. So for many years, including many people, including Einstein, I thought that quantum mechanics is really cannot be true. It makes no sense whatsoever. How can it possibly be that a, a particle doesn't have a well-defined state until you measure it? You just, you just don't know it. It still has a well-defined state. So this is sort of Einstein's and many other people's view that there are so-called these hidden variables. You just don't know about them, but they're there. And you measure something, you just, you just don't know about it, but it's there. There's nothing mysterious about quantum mechanics. So he used to say, the moon not, not exists because you don't look at it. So we all, he used to have arguments with Bohr and Niels Bohr, and they would have these philosophical arguments and so on. So this is, a, of course, a well-defined point coming from, of course, a very, very smart person. And many other people who were very smart had similar hesitations about this. So how do you actually prove that Einstein was wrong? This is what basically Bell did and can be really understood in terms of a simple experiment of sunglasses. Suppose that you draw Venn diagrams. So suppose that you draw sets of all possible hidden variables. That can, you don't know what they are, but imagine they're hidden variables. We don't know what they are. I mean, they could be anything, we don't know, but there's some variables describing your system. Supposing now that you, you have 100 photons that you send through, that make it through polarizer A. Okay, so there are 100 of these photons, particles of light that make it through polarizer A. Now, out of these photons, only 25%, only 15%, I apologize, make it through B. So. In other words, if I ask what makes it for, for, for B, so you see the, the red circles that I had there on the top corresponds to passing through A. And I ask what fraction make it through polarizer B at 22.5 degrees. So I have another set of possible outcomes, this green circle. And when they intersect A and B, that means it passes through A and it passes through B, okay? When it, they, then of course you can have situations where it makes the part makes it through A and does not make it through B. Okay, so you sort of see that you have some sliver here of make, making it through A, and the circle that represents A, but not belonging to a circle representing B. That should correspond to fifteen percent. That should correspond to fifteen photons. So you somehow want to nudge your number of photons 
would appear in the big circle to be such that in that sliver that, that you, I, maybe I have a better cartoon of that here, in the sliver that you have here, but make it for A, but that make it for B, that crescent type shape and so on would correspond to 15%, okay? And then you have another possibility, right? That you, they can make it for B, but not for C, okay? And that again corresponds, as you see here on the top, to 22.5 degrees, so 15% again are, are, are blocked. So that means that 15% We'll, we'll make it for B, but not for C, okay? So now there's a paradox, because if you look at what you actually should have in C, even if we're hidden in variables of weird types, we don't know what they are, just by probability, just by counting essentially, I had 100 photons, I can sort of see how many photons can be at most in one, any one of these crescent type shapes so they can nudge around and so on. And there's no way in the world that can make the number of photons that will be outside of my region to be 30%. There's no way. On the other hand, from experiment, 50% of the photons are blocked. So it doesn't add up. 15 plus 15% is not 50%. And that's the essence essentially of, of Bell's inequalities. So basically these probabilities, these numbers, you can almost write probabilities, these probabilities don't add up, okay? This inequality as a probabilistic inequality should be satisfied if you had hidden variables, but it's not. And so there are no hidden variables. So it's a very simple argument, but so there's no algebra almost, they're just counting, but it's a very profound one. Now people have also measured, people are worried, maybe you can do it, maybe there's something that actually happens when the light goes through the filters and maybe there's some, so maybe you can actually get around that by actually having a different source. You can look at stars, you can use the stars to calibrate what happens through your polarizers. So you look at stars hundreds of your light years away and they're flickering and you, it's basically a random number generator in a sense. Use that to calibrate how your polarizer actually acts, what angle it acts at. You have two buildings far away in Vienna, which is what was actually was done. This is another cartoon from, from another nice set of videos by so-called physics girl. She has very nice explanations. And, and so anyway, I mean, uh, you can do that and you can look at the results of these experiments, again, at different angles. And you'd again find that Bell's inequality is violated, meaning that there are no hidden variables. So, Bell's inequalities basically rule out more precisely something that's called realistic theories, basically assuming that you have a hidden variable describing reality and local theories, that you cannot have long range entanglements. So now it all has to happen locally. There are theories that are still have a hidden variable that are compatible with quantum mechanics, like those of Bohm and also de Boulay initially, he had similar ideas, but, um, we're not very natural. Okay, I shouldn't speak on my behalf. I mean, there are theories like that. There are many theories. But anyway, this Bell's inequality is ruled out the simplest class of theories. Is that clear? Is this, was this clear explanation clear? I, I can give you a yes. similar. Yeah, so that's basically it. That's basically, that's basically clear. Never cartoons, so this is never a cartoon of somebody else. I, I cannot draw so well myself, as I told you. You can have different polarizers and you can sort of see a different entangled photons and sort of see, see what different, what they measure. And you can just do the counting of the probabilities of what different, different people will measure. And again, you'll have a paradox. So you can sort of see what the probability is that somebody will measure along the Z axis, the polarizer to be up. So we can measure along the Q axis to be up and so on. And again, you can derive inequalities for the probabilities, and these inequalities are not satisfied. So they should be satisfied for usual probabilities just by just usual arguments, but they're not satisfied. So, so it just doesn't work. So in other words, it's not that they're hidden variables, it, this is just the way reality is. Unless we have non-locality and, and things like that and so on. 
Um, there is something that um, confused me in some yeah. of the discussion yeah. about this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in which people replace the hidden variables argument with something like quantumness. And that looks pretty much like hidden variables, but not classical. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So I don't know. What, 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 I don't know about that. I have my own pet theory about this, but I don't want to poison you with okay. that. Uh, so my theory is actually it's, it's something actually much more mundane. But uh, but but it's not public. It's a public, public lecture, so I, sh I shouldn't okay. say anything. Yeah, sure. But 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 but, uh, but I don't know about quantumness. I mean, I, I, there are many approaches. I mean, the, also of course, uh, none of course, but. Uh, so sort of Bayesian approaches people try to think about and so on, and cubism, so, so quantum bism and so on. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and of course, all yeah. some rules and interpretations, which you'll hear about later on as well in, in the series. But uh, yeah, I don't know enough to answer your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other questions that you have? So, so the requirements are very easy to do, as you can sort of see. And, but the, but, but the, the consequences are quite profound. So it was really amazing that you have a hidden variable. You could say, how can you measure something that's hidden? How can you rule it out? You still can rule it out. And that's the ingenious behind Bell's inequalities. Even though it's not measurable, you can rule out it doesn't exist. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I guess I'll stop here. If any questions, of course, you can ask me now or you can email me. Uh, later on. And so next week we don't have a meeting, it, it's Halloween, but the week thereafter we'll have again a, a meeting. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for coming in for your questions. <laughs>